since we started with HelloFresh towards the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, I've probably spent each of those last seven years about one third of my time in the US. What you tend to find is that the tech ecosystem is booming in Europe, but founders really face quite a disadvantage compared to the US peers. I've seen it so often high quality European companies just being valued at a massive discount to their US peers, having less access to growth capital. And so overall, I feel there's a ton of high quality companies in Europe, but NASDAQ is still the gold standard for every high growth technology business to be listed on. I think what you tend to see is U.S. investors are way more comfortable with short and midterm investments into growth at the cost of profitability because they understand that in order to build great technology, you have to invest into growth. And sometimes this comes at, at the expense of profitability. Hey, everyone, and thanks for joining us. The purpose of today's recording is to share a little bit about who TO Tech is, introduce you to a few of the founders behind it, and to dive deeper into the vision behind it all. So to jump in today, we're speaking with TO Tech CEO, Roman Kirsch, and TO Tech's chairman, Dominic Richter. Now, given their deep roots in the EU tech ecosystem, you likely already know who they are. But just in case you don't, let's begin with some quick introductions. Dominic, let's start with you. Hey, Brad, excited to be here. So my name is Dominic. I've, for the last 10 years, first started and then scaled HelloFresh in the, into the company that it is today, which is about 10 plus billion in market cap, 12,000 employees across 15 different markets. And what I really liked about that experience over the last 10 years is that it's just been through so many different life cycles. We've started finding product market fit, really scaled the company, internationalized. We're in some markets where it's been super competitive, other markets where we've been sort of like following more of a blue ocean strategy. And so um, I really think that I've been through a lot over those 10 years. And aside from doing that, have also invested into a bunch of companies, more than 35 right now. And so, you know, very happy to be here and very happy to have seen that day together with Roman, our CEO. Perfect. And Roman, you? Yes. I'm also super happy and excited to, to be here with you, Brad, today. Um, so my background is also as a serial entrepreneur. I started my first company at the age of 23. Kazakana, which we eventually sold after approximately a year to a US company, and then uh, continued to build and, and scale and co-found businesses in the e-commerce space and the consumer internet space with uh, you know some more successful exits, also some challenging times, but it was a, a great entrepreneurial run. So we sold uh, two more companies to publicly listed businesses. And in addition, I also began after my first exit to really partner with other entrepreneurs by investing into 20 plus businesses directly investing into several uh, venture capital funds. And, you know, I see Teotech also as a natural transition from, you know, not only partnering with entrepreneurs in the first stage early on, but also in the late stage and helping them transition from a private company to a public company. Perfect. Now, today was a big milestone for Teotech and trading has officially begun on the NASDAQ. But most importantly, this means for the first time, you're actually able to share information with the public that we previously couldn't. So, Let's begin right away with our questions. What exactly is Teotech? So let's start with the basics. We are 300 million US dollars back listed at NASDAQ. And what we look for is to partner with a leading EU tech company with great founders and bring this company public in the US. And at any tech company, it's, uh, you know, we're looking for high quality companies. We're looking for companies that have fast growth. We're looking for companies that are public market ready you know, in the range of a billion to three billion. And, you know, we're looking for companies where we feel that we can, you know, give a lot of value add and, and you know, multiply the shareholder value over the next few years. And who else is involved besides you two? Yeah, so uh, besides Dominic and myself, there's another seven people. So a total of nine individuals. And they all come from three different camps, basically, that I think all equally important to you know, have a successful uh, spec and a successful company afterwards. So it's number one, it's founders and operators. So people who've really founded great businesses, who have operated them. And you know, besides Dominic and myself, we have, for instance, Victor, who is the co-founder of Klarna, 30 billion plus valued fintech out of Sweden. Then number two is we have people who have plenty of M&A experience and who have done plenty of transactions. So as an example, Spiro, who is our CFO, he's been doing over 30 M&A transactions for Delivery Hero, which is a European-based food delivery business. 
And then the third camp is the individuals who have a really great track record of private and public markets investing and who can really identify the segments, the sentiment of the market and really go for the industries that are about to, to really kickstart uh, and kick off. And there we have, for instance, Jan Beckers, a dear friend of ours who has been an entrepreneur before and started his own hedge fund approximately two years ago, which went from 20 million to over a billion dollars under management and has been among the best performing uh, hedge funds and uh, focused on tech over the past two years. So all in all, I think we have a complete set of founders, M&A operators, successful uh, public market investors, which is a great uh, team um, to really be successful. Perfect. And Dom, um, we'll switch to you here. You know, you guys are both European, living in Europe. Why the U.S.? Why did you guys decide to launch a SPAC in the U.S.? Well, if I can jump in here, uh, Brad, I've actually spent a lot of time in the U.S. as well, right? Since we started with HelloFresh towards the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, I've probably spent each of those last seven years about one third of my time in the U.S., so feel that I really have a pretty unique perspective on what's going on in the U.S., what's going on in Europe, and what are actually the differences. What you tend to find is that the tech ecosystem is booming in Europe, but founders really face quite a disadvantage compared to the U.S. peers. I've seen it so often high quality European companies just being valued at a massive discount um, to their U.S. peers, having less access to growth capital. And so overall, I feel there's a ton of high quality companies in Europe. But NASDAQ is still the gold standard for every high growth technology business to be listed on. It also has a lot of uh, spec issues seen over the past 12 months. And so we felt to really be able to attract some of the best and high quality companies in the world being listed as at NASDAQ is definitely an advantage rather than a disadvantage. And so that was, I think, our reasoning why we actually listed on NASDAQ. And another question for you, Don, you know, SPACs are quickly becoming talked about as this alternative to the traditional IPO. Uh, you've been through the process yourself with HelloFresh. What would you say is wrong with that traditional IPO process? So with regard to my own experience with HelloFresh, we actually tried taking HelloFresh public towards the end of 2015. At that point, market conditions changed very drastically overnight. And so we weren't able to do that. We then did it successfully via the traditional IPO route in 2017, listed the business on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, where during that process also considering going to, the, to a US exchange or to another European exchange. So that's the one I had to date the most experience with. And what I know from that process is that number one, it's incredibly expensive. Number two, it's a big distraction to the management team. So it took us twice, you know, six to nine months meeting with different investors, talking to investors, talking to research analysts, introducing them to the business. And at the same time, you have been meeting with a lot of different investors, but you didn't go super deep with any of the investors because what you can actually share in a traditional IPO process is the same set of metrics with every investor. And uh, it's very hard to actually think about how to articulate your vision, where the business should be in three years or in five years time. And those were things that I found back then already quite frustrating. And I think I've heard the same from different founders. As a matter of fact, I think most of the European businesses and some of the US IPOs, when they went public, they had been talking to me because I know them, I have some report with them, and uh, a lot of them actually have told me the same stories. So when you think about all the different ways to go public, then I, you can obviously do sort of like um, traditional IPO route, but I would discourage you from doing so. There is direct listings, which has a lot of advantages over doing um, the traditional IPO process. And I think over the last 12 months, what has become a really viable alternative is doing it via the SPAC route. Because in this background, you can really get to know one of the sponsors really, really well. They can do a deep dive due diligence on you. It's much more time efficient. And so your path towards becoming a public market company is also much, much quicker. On top of that, with the, both the direct listing as well as the traditional IPO process, you're always dependent on overall market timing. And timing can change very, very quickly. I've seen it myself. I've seen it with a lot of other um, great businesses. If the IPO window closes, it may take three months. It may take six months. It may take 12 or 18 months until it opens again. 
And it has nothing to do with your fundamentals. And it has nothing to do with how the business was doing. It's mostly about the IPO window. And I think this is something where if you want to have control over the process and if you want to have control over the destiny of the company, then going by the spec route is something that really maximizes your time spent on that. And it also takes out a lot of the guesswork and the insecurity of actually bringing that process over the finish line. And so in my view, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages with every process, but specs to me definitely feel like they have a number of really, really stark advantages over the traditional IPO route. And so that's obviously why I'm advocating for that. Perfect. Roman, switching back to you here, what makes the US a better environment for startups currently than in Europe? Yeah, so maybe big picture, we are strong believers in, in European tech. You know, If you look at it, the US and Europe have approximately the same number of consumers. They have the same number of you know, engineering talent. GDP is roughly the same. But the U.S. has 10x when it comes to the market cap of tech companies. And, and some of that is, of course, a time lag because Silicon Valley had a kickstart. But if you look in the, to the next few years and to the next decade and next two decades, we believe that a lot of the value creation for tech companies will come from you know, a lot of different geographies, including Europe. One of the big reasons why European tech companies haven't really you know, created so much value so far was A, really challenges in accessing late stage financing b the mindset of you know uh, selling out too early of rather going for the trade sale of rather you know selling to a corporate which is you know partially driven by the mentality of founders but also by the lack of role models and also by a lot of times boards pushing for that early access and three also difficulties in going public in their respective local a lot of times quite small capital markets. And we feel that with Tio Tech, we can you know, give a really good solution to a lot of the founders who have the ambition to build out global category leaders, who have the ambition to kind of build companies that are bigger than this billion dollar trade sale. And that's, I think, what, what we try to solve for. And that's also one of our ambitions to, to help those aspiring entrepreneurs to unlock a lot of value and really you know, get the best out of the companies. So that's kind of our, our thesis and one of the main motivations why we're doing this. If you look actually at you know, the U.S. environment and the U.S. stock markets, I think what you tend to see is U.S. investors are way more comfortable with short and midterm investments into growth at the cost of profitability because they understand that in order to build you know, great technology, in order to kind of be a dominant player in your respective domain, you have to invest into growth. and Sometimes it, this comes at, at the expense of profitability. And obviously, companies like Amazon and, and others are a great example for, for how that can work. And that mindset is just way, way more common in the US. That's why technology stocks have better multiples on average in the US. You're talking about on, you know, a 25 to 30% discount in terms of multiples like like. So that means you have easier access to capital. You can raise more money. And it's totally fine to invest into growth and be able to communicate your, your long-term strategy and your long-term uh, vision and not go from quarter to quarter and talk about, you know, immediate profitability. So um, those are the things that, that really are the biggest drivers for us when talking to founders and when convincing founders that U.S. is a lot of times a better listing venue to go public. And what you've seen over the past, you know, uh, years is that a lot of tech stocks uh, that are listed in U.S., have actually no business whatsoever in the US. You know, you look at Mercado Libre, which is a Latin American business. You look at C Limited, which is a Southeast Asian business. You look at Jumia, which is an African e-commerce business. And those have been, you know, the best performing stocks or among the best performing stocks in the US. So uh, also US investors get businesses that don't necessarily operate in the US and quite well, and are more than happy to, to kind of tap into that additional growth potential in other geographies. And we've talked a lot about the benefits here of going public in the US, the benefits of SPACs, but to go back a little bit, what about the benefits of just going public in general? Dom, if you want to maybe take this one, you know, why should founders consider going public in the first place? 
So I think there are a lot of advantages with going public and being a public company, but there are also some some disadvantages. And uh, I definitely want to caveat that I think uh, going public is amazing if you have reached a certain scale, if you have reached certain traction, but there's also very good reasons to uh, stay private for long, build out the business, understand your financial projections, follow your strategy sort of like as a private company. When you go public though, and I think uh, we're talking here mostly about companies that have raised a lot of growth capital. So companies that at some point are then looking for some type of exit or liquidity event because they have actually attracted capital, growth capital that at some point wants to see an exit and return capital to their LPs. So if you are one of those companies, then I think it's just so many advantages over doing a trade sale. I've seen it many, many times before. I've seen it with my own company. I've seen it with a lot of investments. I've seen with a lot of other founders, there's so much value creation potential still in the public markets. And going public for founders, for entrepreneurs or management teams is not an exit. It's a financing event. And then you can continue to capture a lot of the upside in the public markets. And if you look at, you know, just a basket of some of the biggest even European tech companies, such as ourselves, you know, Delivery Hero, Salando, Takeaway Group, Just Eat, a lot of others, there's just been immense value creation in the public markets. Now, if you had done a trade sale as a founder of one of those businesses, you obviously would have left a lot on the table and not been able to, to actually benefit from that sustained long-term growth momentum that all of these companies had. And so I think, you know, there's very, very clear advantage of going public rather than doing a trade sale. And it's actually one of the discussions that I have very, very often with different founders that actually tell me, you know, our board feels like we should sell the company or we should uh, potentially think about combining with someone else or merging with a competitor or anything like that. And uh, my pitch is very often like, look at all those great companies that went public. And that was, you know, the beginning of the next chapter rather than a, a, a true exit event for you, for you as a founder. And, you know, that's just one. But then there are other smaller advantages, such as once you are public, you obviously can attract really good talent because you have liquid stock options stock options that uh, people can redeem almost every year. You have an acquisition currency. So if you actually want to do M&A deals, it's much, much easier to do that as a public company, to agree on value as a public company. And uh, those are things that can also then supercharge or turbocharge your growth going forward. So if you are a company that is over a certain revenue threshold, that has good projections and good forecastability of uh, where metrics are heading over the next couple of years, then I think being public is definitely the right place to be and the place that allows you for maximum value creation over the next couple of years. You know, every day I wake up and it seems there's a new SPAC launching and there's just more and more that are coming out. So what makes you guys think that founders are going to want to go with you over some of those other SPACs? That's a really good question, Brett. So maybe first big picture. I think when you look at the stock markets at the moment, there's 40% less public companies than there were 20 years ago. So we feel that, you know, the whole spec boom is something positive because it helps to bring a lot of private companies back into the public sphere and make them accessible to all types of different investors. So that said, I think we are still at very early stages in Europe. So for four unicorns in uh, the US, you'd have one unicorn in Europe. But for 300 specs in the US, you have basically just three that are focused on Europe. So, you know, the relationship is 100 to 1. And obviously, we would welcome plenty of more specs for uh, good quality targets in Europe. But we're also happy that being one of the first, we can actually select the best targets. Why are we different or what is our key differentiator? I think we're a founder-led spec. So we have, uh, you know, nine individuals who've all been there in the past decade plus um, of building businesses, of talking to founders, of investing into founders. And I think this is the key differentiator. And there's plenty of data that operate or founder-led investments vehicles. For instance, VCs, but also SPACs outperform um, those that are done purely by financial advisors. And why is that? I think it's because um, uh, it has a lot to do with pre-investment um, value creation from us, from founder side, and post-investment value creation. So I'm going to talk about the pre-investment value creation. Dominic can maybe talk about what we'll do after, after the business combination. So pre-investment, I think, where it really makes a difference is at two different stages. Number one, 
is when we talk about uh, the diligence part. So I think we've been in the ecosystem um, for quite some time. And I think it, it comes more natural for us to really understand the main drivers of the business to really make the diligence. And I think that's where a lot of the investors trust us. The second thing is, you know, the long-term view that we have. So we're not there to kind of to invest for a year or two. We are there to be key supporters, shareholders of the business. And that's also how we select the investors into our spec that was listed today. So what we actually care about is that the people who buy into us, who buy, who kind of invest into us, and um, that they have sticky money, have a long-term view, and really want to support this company from going from a billion or two to 10, 20, 30 over a longer period of time. I think this is where not all specs are created equally and uh, where a lot of them are actually focused on the short-term gain or short-term flipping, which is you know definitely something that I as a founder would not want to do if it would be my company. So I would definitely ask that question to specs. What's your investment horizon? What kind of investors are you bringing to the table? Because there's a lot of differences there. And if I can just um, expand on you know your answer, Roman, I think when you look at the nine individuals that make up Geotech, then we really tried to come together as a team and to bring something unique to the table through each of the individuals who are behind that. And for us, it really starts with the um, um, business combination. And then it's about making sure that post business combination as a public company, the company can do you know, as well as possible and unlock its true potential. When you think about all of the different sectors out there, when you think about our private investment portfolios, what we've seen a lot is that we can help companies think through their growth strategy and really help them have to guide them through all of the different life stages of the companies, whether it's about, you know, working on the fundamentals around customer acquisition, customer retention, or better monetization of customers, whether it's with internationalization, potentially going to the US or doing M&A transactions. I think there's a bunch of opportunities where we think we can be value add. And, you know, that value add that can be really important because um, as I tried to reference in one of the previous questions, there's a lot of value creation happening once you are a public company. And this is where you know most of our upside is. This is where most of the upside for founders is, where most of the upsides for the board is, is to look at the two, three, five years after the company has become public and how much value creation, how much the company has multiplied over that period. That's what we're really focused on. And that's where we want to play an active role through being a board member and making accessible all of the individuals that we have uh, assembled um, and come together for Teotech. Well, I think that's all we're going to have time to cover for today. Thank you both for your time. Thank you to everyone who's listened. And if you want to find out more about Teotech, you can visit www.teotechspec.com. Look forward to seeing what happens in the next 6 to 12 months. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks Brad. Brad. That was fun. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.